Good morning. I just want to give you all a warm welcome to our online service this week at Mansfield Pentecostal Church. Whether you're from the church or if you're dropping in from another church or if you've never been to a church, we just want to give you a warm welcome. I trust that you'll be blessed this day with God's presence and what you have to hear and what we have to hear from the Word of God this morning. We're going to have a time of worship, we're going to hear the Word of God, we're going to break bread together, friends. And let me just encourage you all to join in. I just really want to read a, a passage from Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Let me just encourage you this morning, friends, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. We've got so much to thank God for, friends. Whatever we're going through, we can thank him for his grace. First and foremost, that we have been saved by grace through faith. And then, let me just encourage you this week, friends, just to sit there for a few moments and just to list the grace of God upon your life, the blessings that he's poured upon your lives. And you will realise his goodness towards you. And you'll start to worship and praise him because you'll realise the good things that the Lord has done for you. And you'll just remember the goodness of God this week. Let me encourage you to do that, friends. We're going to have a time of worship and then we're going to hear the word of God before we break bread together. And I'll speak to you later. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. Uh, I've just got a little question again for you today. Um, have you ever thought about what God thinks about you? Have a little think in your head. And while you're thinking, I want you to picture God in heaven. He is the creator of the whole universe and everything in it. And he is sitting on his awesome throne with all of his angels surrounding him. And he is looking down at us and he can see what we do all the time and he can hear what we think and he can hear what we say and i just want you to think about what god thinks about you when you think about all of that now sometimes it can be a bit scary thinking about this sometimes we can think that if he's seen all of the things that i've ever done or said or even thought even the bad things he might not like us very much Sometimes we can think he might even be cross with us, which is a really scary thought to think that the God of the whole universe might be cross with us. And we can sometimes think to ourselves, I don't think he would have liked me very much when I was being naughty or not listening to my mum. Or maybe I don't think he would like me very much when I'm yelling at my brother or sister or whatever it is that we do that we know is wrong, but we sometimes do. And sometimes when we start thinking these things, the devil tries to talk to us and he tries to trick us into believing that God can't like us because we have done something that God doesn't like and that's called sin. But this is a complete and utter lie. God knows everything about us and he knows us completely and he doesn't just like us, he loves us just as we are. Not who we sometimes pretend to be. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you're with different people, you, you act a bit differently? Maybe if you're at school, you sometimes act a bit different than when you're at home. Or if you're hanging out with a certain group of friends, you'll act different to how you 
um, act at church. But God sees past all of those different types of people that we sometimes pretend to be, and he sees exactly who we are. The person that he thought up in his perfect mind and created with all the little quirks and the personality traits that we have, that sometimes we think that people won't like, so we try and hide them. But he loves them because he made you that way. And this is how God sees us when he looks at us. He doesn't sit there on his throne writing a list of all the stuff that we've done wrong and saying, I don't like that about that person or I don't like that thing about that person. He sits there loving us just as we are. And if we are doing things that God doesn't like, then he gently tries to lead us away from those things because he knows that those things will hurt us and eventually lead to death. This made me think it's just like a parent who is trying to cross the road with their child when they're little and they guide them away from all the things that could hurt them and they show them how to cross the road safely. This is how God guides us away from all the wrong things that we might be doing. God loves us so much that he gave up his son Jesus so that if we believe in him and follow Jesus, he will lead, lead us safely home to God, where we will get to live forever being loved by God. So when we think about God in heaven, looking at everything we do and say and think, and we start to think that God can't love that bit of me, or he can't love me when I've done something like that, then just say no. You can say it out loud if you if you need to. And remember that God loves you. And in Romans 8 verses 37 and 38, one of Jesus' disciples who saw how God loved us through Jesus' life and death and resurrection said this. Yes, I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love. Not death, life, angels or ruling spirits. I am sure that nothing now, nothing in the future, no powers, nothing above us or nothing below us, nothing in the whole creator world will ever be able to separate us from the love God has shown us in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God doesn't want us to be down here on earth thinking about how cross he might be with us because we've done something wrong or said or something that we might have thought. He wants us to be thinking, wow, God loves me even with those things and nothing can stop God's love. So let me ask you again, what do you think God thinks when he looks at you? Have a little think this morning. Good morning everybody. 
Um, I just want to say again a massive thank you to everybody who has been contributing to the community projects that we've been doing to the food hampers at Christmas and just contributing their time and their money and their prayers and their um, food just throughout the whole of last year and on to this year as well I just want to we have been so so blessed and I just want to say a massive thank you um, we are hoping to uh, hopefully carry on our community outreach projects throughout the year. Um, so last week we did a pancake decorating competition where we got to send some pancake ingredients out to some of the families um, that were connected to and some of them joined in on a Zoom pancake decorating competition which they absolutely loved. It was really good. Um, and the next one that we're hoping to do is a Mother's Day special. So we're hoping to do an afternoon tea box for um, each of our mothers that are connected with us just to just to give them a special treat on Mother's Day because I know some of them have had a really tough year. Um, so if anybody would like to help us out with that, with any baking or any um, donating of money, then please do get in contact with us and I will let you know what you can do for us. Um, and yeah, we will just keep you updated with all the upcoming events as and when they come. And a massive thank you again. There is a song I know
Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Kate, for introducing the service there. And I want to give a warm welcome to visitors and uh, members alike to our MPC online Sunday morning service. I trust you're enjoying our time together. And uh, hey, what a just an amazing uh, response there was over Christmas uh, with the food hampers appeal. And I just want to thank everyone who uh, just played a part of that, and uh, and for all of those who were who managed to pull that together and to get it all uh, organized. Well, I feel both uh, grateful and very uh, fortunate to have grown up in a home where I was shown uh, unconditional love. Uh, you know, my parents showed me love in various ways. Uh, one way they showed me love was that they were always there for me uh, when I needed it. I remember in my teenage years, uh, for those of you who were part of the church will know this, I used to have kidney problems. I remember I used to be staying up until the early hours of the morning uh, in discomfort and pain and my dad was there with me uh, throughout the night and then also they showed me their unconditional love also uh, at times in bringing needed correction to me uh, when when i needed it and i know that that foundation of unconditional love uh, actually provided a secure foundation for me throughout my life it's helped me to engage better with people it's helped me to uh, deal with issues, I believe, in a more secure way because of the confidence that was instilled in my life because I knew the unconditional love of my parents. You know, in this book, uh, How to Really Love Your Child, the psychiatrist, Dr. Ross Campbell, he states this, he says this, in order to love my children, I must remember that number one, they are children. Number two, they tend to act like children. Number three, much of the childish behavior is unpleasant, okay? Number four, if I do my part as a parent and love them despite their childish behavior, they will be able to mature and give up childish ways. Number five, if I only love them when they please me, i.e. conditional love, and convey my love to them only during those times they will not feel genuinely loved. This in turn will make them insecure, damage their self-image, actually prevent them from moving on to uh, having better self-control and more mature behavior. And therefore, their behavior is my responsibility. But number six, if I love them unconditionally, they will feel good about themselves and be comfortable with themselves and they then will be able to control their anxiety and turn their behavior as they grow into adulthood. Now Dr. Uh, Campbell's research along with the research of many other psychiatrists and psychologists of the years certainly affirms and confirms this that that if we grow up in an environment, particularly in the early years, where we experience unconditional love, it sets a secure foundation for us for later on in life and sets us up for success. But what this morning, if you are someone who hasn't experienced unconditional love, you didn't get that love from your, your parents, where can you find that? Because actually we all need this type of love in our lives if we are to make a, a, a good success of the choices that we make. And the good news is this, that even if you do not know this love in your home, in your family, you have a heavenly Father who loves you unconditionally. And when you experience that love of, the, of your heavenly Father, when you know that love, it provides a secure foundation for you as you engage in life and in your relationships with other people. It was John, the beloved disciple, who said, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. You see, knowing the, the Father's love in our hearts and lives as I mentioned, sets a secure foundation in our lives so that we can love others. And you know, if you've uh, never experienced, as I said before, the, the, the love of your natural father, you can know the love of your heavenly father. And in knowing that love of your heavenly father, you are in a better place to nurture friendships and relationships with different people. 
Now, for those of you who've been following this series over these last few weeks, you know that we've been looking at the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the two lost sons, and are valuing the valuable series from Luke chapter 15, where we're looking at coming into this year, 2021, what things are truly important in each of our lives. We've seen last week that a party is called for when someone comes back into a right relationship with God, that we value lost people who've lost their sense of purpose and direction in life by helping them reconnect with God, that we can, all be, we can be lost and not realize we're lost. We saw that with the story of the oldest son. And then from the story of the youngest son, we've also seen that we're useful to God and to others when we align our thinking with God's thinking and when we seek to fulfill our desires the right way. But I want us to, to look at how can we have a security in our lives that enables us to love other people can unconditionally, that helps us to nurture uh, loving, healthy relationships. You know, the Bible describes this unconditional love. It's described, often described as agape love. Now, when we think of love, we also often have different notions and ideas of love. There's romantic love, okay, that we have between a man and a woman. There is caring love. Uh, one person cares after another. There's the, there's the French, the love of friendship. I want to suggest to you this morning that actually there's a love that's much deeper and much more profound than any of those types of loves. And that is the unconditional love of agape love. You see, in this story of the father and has lost his sons, we reveal that the, the, the love that the father had for his two sons is a picture of the love that God, our Heavenly Father, has for us. And that means there's something we can learn uh, in how we love each other. And so I want us to look at this question this morning. How can we nurture loving relationships? How, we, how can we practice this unconditional love in our relationships to other people? Let's uh, read the story of the example of the father. I'm going to start from verse 20 of chapter 15 and it reads as follows. And so he, the son, got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best, best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders and yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home you kill the fattened calf for him my son the father said you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You know, this story completely confounds our expectations as to what love actually is. You see, the young son, just as the young son was, um, had just blown his, his father's inheritance, he had just, he's, he's been living a wasteful, proliferate life. He has, uh, you know, been totally irresponsible with what has been given to him. And given this, as he makes his, his way home, 
We may wonder what sort of reception he's going to receive from his father when he comes back. You know, at worst, we would expect that his father would completely disown him and reject him for you know, making the choices that he made. And maybe at the best, that his father would begrudgingly accept him back into the family. And the, the thing that really stands out in this is that Jesus completely blows away all our expectations as to what we think of love when he says that he the father when he sees a son is filled with compassion for him he ran to his son he threw his arms around him and he kissed him out of this unconditional agape love the father was moved by a compassionate Response. Now, this word for this compassion, his heart was filled with compassion. It's the same word that is used throughout the New Testament when it describes that Jesus, out of compassion, healed the sick or reached out to the poor. And it's the same compassion here that leads the Father to, be re to being reunited with his Son, with a full and complete embrace. You see, the Son had come to that place of repentance he was willing to be a servant but even before he could say sorry he had known the full acceptance and embrace of his father's unconditional compassionate love and you know what it didn't matter what had happened in the past his son had come home you know in the same way as we come to our heavenly father we also experience the compassion of our heavenly father and it is his compassion that reunites us with him to experience this unconditional love it causes us it, and, and this love in our hearts as we take those steps towards him as we experience this father's our, our father's embrace in our lives this love that we experience in this is a love that we can also share to those people around us. That's why John, going back to the, to the beloved disciples, said that we love because he first loved us. And so given that a foundation for loving other people starts when we first experience our Heavenly Father's love in our lives, how then can we nurture loving relationships to those around us? First thing I would say from this story that we can learn is that we need to respect people's choices. Unconditional love does not try to control people. It doesn't try to smother people, but is always prepared to let people make their own choices to do what they want to do of life, even when those are choices that you, you and I may not necessarily want. Notice that when the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, he divided the property between them. You know, the father did not try to control or manipulate his son. He didn't try to make his choices for him. He respected his son's desire to make his own mind and decide what he wanted to do, even though he did not agree with that. And that's where love starts ultimately. Unconditional love for people starts by respecting the choices that they make, by respecting where they are at in their life journey. You see, his love, the father's love for his son was revealed in allowing his younger son to make his own choices, even if that would take them in a different course. You know, I find it incredible that Almighty God, the most powerful being in this whole universe, will never make you do something that you don't want to do. He will never coerce you into making choices that you are not ready to make. And even when you make choices that God is not happy with or pleased with, He will not stop you from making those choices. And likewise, you show love in your relationships to your peers and to those around you by respecting the choices that they make, even if they cause you pain. Now this you know, can be a problem in all sorts of relationships, but particularly when we think in a, in a marriage. Sometimes 
In a marriage, uh, controlling and manipulative behaviors can unfold, where one spouse tries to get the other spouse to do what they want to do, but that is not love. Paul says that love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Unconditional love accepts where people are at. It respects a person's sense of autonomy. And that's why if you've not known the unconditional love of your heavenly Father in your life, you will not have a security in your life to be able to respect the autonomy of other people's decisions and choices. And particularly when they make decisions of where they want to go in a different direction to what you want. And so be prepared to let go. That's what the Father's love did here in this story. But to nurture love in your relationships, the second thing that you can do is give people time. See, when those you love have made a choice, that have made choices that break your heart, when they don't want to do life with you, or, be, or when it's not possible to be in relationship with them because of certain behaviors, love waits. It keeps the door of hope open. I love what we read here in this next part of the story because we see that when the son came to his senses and he starts to return home, Jesus says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, which means that his father waited. His love for his son got him up every morning to look over that vast distance that his son and the hope would someday return. And every day as he looked over that distant horizon, he must have experienced many disappointments when a distant figure turned out not to be his son, but just a passerby. And yet his father still looked in hope, longing, anticipating. How long did the father wait? Jesus does not say. But he waited, not knowing if his son would return. And that if he did choose to be returned, it would be a choice of his own free will. Are you prepared to wait on those who have made choices that you don't agree with? Think for a moment of your heavenly father's patience with you. You know, when you was making choices that God was not pleased with, and you was doing your own thing and going your own way, and yet your heavenly father waited for you. He loved you so much that he desired your free and uncoerced choice to come back to him. He has hopes for you. He has longings for you. He has dreams for you to fulfill in relationship with him. And that's why when you know the Father's love in your life, when you have that secure foundation of your heavenly Father's love in your heart, you are prepared to wait. You are prepared to be patient on those around you, those loved ones around you who have maybe made some choices that you're not happy with or uh, are breaking your heart. That's why Paul says that love is patient. You know, one of the best ways that you can wait for a loved one who maybe you're out of relationship with at this time is to pray for them. And so I want to encourage you to nurture and loving relationships, re respect a person's sense of autonomy. That's where unconditional agape love starts. Respect that some people will make their own choices and you respect that. Be prepared to wait on them. Keep that door open to them. Thirdly, value connection before formality. Love is not cultivated in an atmosphere of procedure, but of heart connection. Now, I've mentioned before that when the youngest son's father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son, 
You know, that action did not conform with the social norms and protocols of what was expected of an older man, particularly in that ancient Near East culture of Jesus' day. But the indignity of that act was nothing compared to the restoring of that, of that relationship. You see, his father, running to his son, revealed the intensity of those longings, hopes, desires that he had towards him. You see, stuffy formality does not, uh, uh, does not exp- um, bring about love. In fact, it chokes the spontaneous expression of love. And as your heavenly father does not care about breaking formality to to be reunited with you in your relationships with other people, it is more important that you connect from your heart to others than to adhere to social norms and protocols. And so respect a person's freedom to make their own choices. Be willing to wait for them. But when they make that step, to reconnect back with you, value connection before formality. But the fourth thing that we can learn about nurturing loving relationships is value the heart over the hand. Value the heart over the hand. Do you know that sometimes the people who are closest to you can often be the hardest ones to love? You know, though it's not possible to love without giving, it is possible actually to give without loving. I do think it's possible to give without, out of just a sense of formality and duty rather than out of love. Now, you would think in this story that we've just read that the older son would have been happy that his younger son had come back home, his own flesh and blood had been restored. But instead of going to the celebration, we read that the older brother became angry and refused to join in. And in not going into the celebration, he refused to share in his father's joy because he valued the work of his hands before the connection of his heart. He valued his duty before his relationship to his brother. You see, love starts with those who are closest to you. And if you haven't learned to love those who are closest to you, then I believe that you've missed the whole point. You know, the Bible says that if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You notice that when the father had learned that his oldest son was not attending the celebration of his youngest son, I love his response. He went out and pleaded with him. And then he says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You know, these words reveal not only the father's tenderness and compassion to his son, but that he did, but the father desired his son's presence before his production. He desired his heart connection before the work of his hands. You know, these words, that everything that I have is yours, is actually a similar expression in the original language to when the father earlier divided his property to his youngest son. And what this shows is this, that the father in this story had no favorites. He loved his older son as much as he loved his younger son. And the reason the older son served out of a sense of duty, the reason why the older son gave his hand before he gave his heart was because he never understood the unconditional love of his father. If he had took the time to know his father, he would have found a life, he would have found a life and a love out of that relationship that would have brought meaning and significance to to his work. 
And you know what? When you know that your, your Heavenly Father doesn't have favorites, but He just has favor, that He has promised that He'll never leave you or forsake you, that He desires your presence before your production, He desires your heart connection before your hand, then you experience that unconditional love. You can show that same love to other people and that you value that heart connection with other people before your service and the giving of your hand and your production. So knowing the Father's love sets a secure foundation to loving others. And so to nurture unconditional love in our relationships, remember, respect people's choices, respect their sense of autonomy, give people time. You know, give them to work time to work through the issues that they need to work through while keeping that door open. Value connection before formality and value the heart over the hand. And so I've explained to you this morning, to all of us this morning, that for us to truly become loving people, we first need to know the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father. You know, during the, uh, the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector of England at that time, sentenced a soldier to be shot for his crimes. And the execution was to take place during the evening curfew when the bell would ring. However, for some reason, the bell did not sound. And so uh, the, the soldier wasn't shot because the, the, the bell wasn't heard. And what happened was, the soldier's fiance had climbed into the bell, and she prevented the clapper from striking from the sides of the bell with her, with her hands. And so she was summoned to Cromwell to give an account for her actions. And she wept, and she showed Oliver Cromwell her bruised and her bleeding hands. And Cromwell's heart was touched, and he said, Your lover shall live because of your sacrifice. Curfew shall not ring tonight. Do you know, as the soldier's fiancé showed her love, and that she gave of herself, so God our Father reveals his love to us by giving to us of his very best. The Father's unconditional love is seen in the nail-printed hands, the wounded side, and the blooded cross of His Son. Love has a name, and His name is Jesus. And if today if you have not experienced that love, I want to invite you to turn from everything that you know is wrong in your life and to put your trust, an ongoing trust, in the Lord Jesus Christ, to get immersed in water in his name, to receive of his spirit, and so receive a secure foundation where you can know the unconditional love of your heavenly Father in your life. And as you know that love, out of that foundation love, you can nurture loving relationships to the people in your world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the love of you, the unconditional love of you in our hearts and our lives. I pray that, Lord God, that for all of us here, that we will know that love in its fullness. And as we experience your unconditional love in our lives, that, Lord, that you'll help us to show that same love to people around us by respecting their choices, by waiting on them, by, Lord, valuing that heart connection before formality or performance, dear God. And, Lord, I pray that you will grow us to become more loving people because of our security in you we can bring security in our relationships to the people around us in our world and so god we just entrust these things into your hands in jesus name amen if today you've not yet experienced 
the love of your heavenly Father. Uh, I want to invite you in this prayer, and as I pray this prayer, just repeat these words after me in your heart. And uh, you know what's important isn't so much that you repeat the words, but actually you mean these words, and that's the key thing. Let me invite you uh, in this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Just take a moment to maybe ask for God's forgiveness for things that you know that are wrong in your life. Please forgive me. And now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life and live with me by your spirit forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, please drop me an email uh, below. And uh, I want to give you a warm welcome into the greatest family in the world. You're my brother and sister in Christ. Thank you. And I'll uh, send you some details to help you along the way. Uh, you know, we're going to just kind of come into a time of worship and praise. And as we do so, afterwards, Kate's going to lead us in our communion this morning. Hey, listen, have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. And I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Bye. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
Just as we come round the table of the Lord this morning, I just want to share with you a verse that's been popping up all over the week with me this week. Um, and it is in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 and it says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but many of us do not like to even talk about our weaknesses, never mind boast about them. And sometimes we can put on the mask um, that shows everyone that we're doing absolutely fine and we're getting along okay, that kind of don't you worry about me face, when deep down we are struggling with our weaknesses. In that feeling that we just can't do everything to the standard that we set up in our minds. Maybe we feel like we're just not enough and we keep falling short of that, of what we feel we should be doing or where we feel we should be in our minds. Now, I will be very honest with you this morning um, and boast about my weaknesses. Earlier on this week, I was just having one of those days where I woke up fine in the morning, I got a nice idea of what the day was going to look like, I was going to do this, this and this, and it was going to be a lovely day, and probably about an hour in, and everything had just fallen short of my expectations, and the standard that I'd set in my mind. And, and it's those standards of what being a good mum is going to be like and what being a good wife is going to be like or even being a good follower of Jesus is going to be like but you know God knew I needed this verse this week and maybe somebody else listening this morning needs to know this verse and you know if we could do everything in our own strength like sometimes we try to we would have no need for God I never thought I would say it, but I am glad of those days where I feel like I'm just failing at everything or that I've run out of steam or run out of enthusiasm and you just feel exhausted from all the pressure that you put yourself under more than anything. Because on those days, that is where I come to the end of me and you've got no choice but to cry out to God for help. And I know that when I've come to the end of me, it is only the beginning of what God can do in me. So if anyone this morning is struggling in their weaknesses, whatever they might be, be glad about it because this is the place that draws us closer to God. And we can cry out to him for help and know the fullness of Christ's power in our lives. So as we come round the cross this morning, and come round to the table of the Lord, just bring all of those failed expectations or unmet standards that we set up in our minds and just lay them at the foot of the cross this morning. And as we just look up to Jesus on that cross, we don't get a more clearer picture of this verse this morning, where he says, my power is made perfect in weakness. Our weakness is our sinful nature. But when we look at the cross, we see how Christ's power of salvation is made perfect in our weakness. That it's not of ourselves, because we're not enough. We couldn't do what Christ did on the cross. We would never be enough, because it's our nature. We can't do it. Just like we can't meet those standards, and we can't meet all those expectations we set up for ourselves. But it is because of his amazing grace that we have been saved and set free from all the guilt and the shame that comes with all those feelings of failure. And his grace is sufficient for us today. It is all that we need. And as we just stand in awe of this free gift of all sufficient grace that he is offering out to us, we can accept it this morning and just allow his power to just rest on us as we take the bread and take the wine. 
and we're just going to take the bread. And take the wine. Lord God, we just thank you this morning for your amazing grace. That it saves us, Lord Jesus. That when we don't feel like we can, we are enough, Lord God. That you are more than enough for us, Lord God. And that you are giving your son Jesus to fill us up with your power and love in our lives, Lord God. That we don't have to face every day by ourselves. But you are with us every single day of our lives and your power fills us up, Lord God. And I pray for everyone watching this morning that they'll just feel that grace pour upon their lives, Lord Jesus, this morning. And that you'll just feel them, that they'll just feel their, your power just rest upon them. Amen. Thank you again. See you soon. You were the word at the beginning One with God, the Lord most high Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name
Well, I hope you've been blessed this morning with God's word and the worship that we've had together. I trust you've had a good time and I just pray and ask God that he will just bless you throughout this coming week. I just want to give a few notices. On Tuesday at 6.45 we have our online Bible teaching and then on Tuesday at 7.30 we have our Zoom prayer meeting. If you'd like to join the prayer meeting, please contact Matthew through the website and he will give you all the details that you need to know to join that. If you can join, let me encourage you to join that prayer meeting. Have such a blessed time as we pray together for the things and for the work of God. Just one advance notice, we are open, open to open the church, reopen the church on a Sunday morning on the 14th of March. So God willing, we will be open on that day and I will be in touch with you to let you know who's available and who, who can come on that day. We're going to have to work it the same as before where we rotate on Sundays for most people. So, But I will be in touch with you before that date to let you know if you're here on the 14th or the 21st. And if you didn't come before lockdown and you want to be included this time, then please give me a call and let me know. I will try and ring everyone anyway, but uh, let me know and then I'll make sure you're included. And finally, let me encourage you to keep praying for each other, keep in touch with each other, and also to contact the church if you need anything from us. If we can help you in any way, please contact us and let us help you where we can. And may God bless you all this coming week. Thank you once again for joining us and I trust we'll see you again next week. God bless you all.